Um, <coughs> thanks, everybody, for being here. And um, thanks, for Maria, for organizing and inviting me. Um, <coughs> I'm from the same team as Tim. I, re I joined roughly a year ago, uh, Exeter, the Tim's uh, Global Systems Institute. And he wants this multidisciplinary group to be gradually built at the University of Exeter. So it's a very nice place to be. So that's uh, where I am based. Um, but I work very closely with Hector, who spoke yesterday. So we work on the same model. So everything he said is relevant to what I'm talking about for those who were there. Um, and I'm also based part, -time, part of the time in Cambridge, where I've been for many years. And some people know me f from that affiliation. Um, <coughs> All right, so I'm going to talk about something slightly different than Hector talked about. Um, that's some piece of work we've done last year that had quite a bit, made quite a bit of noise in the media, actually, where we, normally what we would do um, in our team, Hector and I and the others, we would um, assess climate policies, say for the European Commission or other governments or different people Irina, different people who, did, um, who want to ask questions about climate policy. But we came across this problem that um, in some of our projections, we could see the demand for fossil fuels turns out quite different than what many other groups were projecting. And that's partly to do with the degree of uh, attention we put to technology. OK, here's the team. So <coughs> uh, there's us in Exeter. We don't see very bright. Uh, anyway, there's Cambridge Econometrics, Cambridge University. Cambridge University have um, Jorge Vinuales is a professor of environmental law, and he's very good in geopolitics, and so has contributed a lot. We've got our colleagues, climate scientists at the Open University here, and Gregor, who was at SOAS and is moving in the process of moving to to the U.S. Um, <coughs> okay, so you. We'll know this picture probably from the Bank of England's report talking about different scenarios of emissions and energy use effectively um, and the risks associated to them. Now that's kind of a new debate. I think it's interesting. It's different from the traditional debate from the IPCC where you're talking about financial risk in relation to either climate change or change of technology. Right? So if you've got You've got high emission scenarios that's going to lead to physical risks, flooding, uh, storms, um, all sorts of damage, while low carbon scenarios are characterized differently by what they call transition risks, where it's the tra rapidity of the transformation of the economy that generates financial risk, an accumulation of systemic risk. Um, <coughs> in the IPCC um, 1.5 report, um, there's been various scenarios suggested <coughs> that can meet the 1.5 target within the carbon budget. And all of them obviously are characterized with super rapid technological change. That's in the models. But the models don't really tell much what happens to the financial sector if you've got to scrap so much capital so rapidly. Right? That's kind of the new, one of the new questions arising. And the question is whether you can make the economy go around a very sharp bend that rapidly without perhaps losing some pieces around that bend, right? So what do we lose uh, as we do this? Um, okay, so I'm just going to talk about fossil fuel assets, nothing else, right? But we could look at, you can think of the question much more broadly because you could think of buildings, factories, all sorts of capital that is long lived. Okay, so in the case of fossil fuel assets, we mean when we talk sometimes about say un unburnable carbon, you, you may think of reserves that never end up being burned, right? If these are valued on um, company balance sheets, that could cause trouble in terms of the value of these companies and then have knock-on effects in the financial sector. But really, why this matters financially is because to get this out of the ground, you need long-lived capital. And that long-lived capital typically involves finance, which may be bank or maybe um, equity-based, but often if it's bank finance, then what happens is that somebody, somebody has this on their land, say, use this as collateral to borrow funds 
in order to invest in all of that capital, and that's supposed to be paid for using the returns from extracting the fossil fuels from the ground, right? Now, if, say, there's uh, a change in price, that could make this activity somehow unprofitable, and this might never end up paying for itself back in certain conceivable scenarios. So, uh, and ultimately, who owns this? There's a whole chain of people and institutions. It can go all the way up to pension funds, investment funds, banks, and so on. So there's where the trouble could be. Okay, so imagine that, and that's going to be my definition here for stranded fossil fuel assets. So imagine that you've got investors having, come on. <laughs> okay, there you go. Uh, an expected supply and expected price trajectory. They form their expectations based on this and can decide whether to invest in something. For example, deep offshore or Arctic oil or something like that, right? Tara Sands in Canada. Now, perhaps what happens is something else. So red is projected scenario, green is realized scenario. And then you, there could be a loss. The, the loss would be if people have invested in capital <coughs> that becomes unused, the difference would be uh, the, the, the price and supply difference multiplied and summed to a certain date. At least that's a simple way we could estimate that. Okay, so, right, how did we do this? It's, it's relatively simple, but ultimately we use a pretty large model to do this. So it's a model of the whole world's energy system, whole world's economy in, in a lot of detail, and then we make scenarios. So we have a model of the global economy that is macroeconometric. It's um, roughly 15 econometric equations that, are, that make a closed system for things like investment, employment, uh, um, <coughs> demand for goods and services. And to this we pl plug in very detailed technology models that look at fleets of cars, fleets of uh, power generation equipment, uh, fleets of uh, steel, making plants and so on with a lifetime and a rate of technological change and a, a dynamic for diffusion and to this we have a global energy market and resources model that's connected to that so that's got lots of uh, oil and gas wells for example coal mines represented and then we just use uh, some policy assumptions to, and typically we, we go all the way to the climate. We have a climate model in, involved in this too. So we can um, um, use certain assumptions of policy and see whether it meets a certain climate target, right? Okay. Now, a bit more detail, we have these models of fleets of power plants, right? They have a lifetime and we have a rate at which they may or may not become replaced by new types of equipment. So that's integrated to the economy. Um, this will, for example, create jobs when it uh, involves uh, lots of capital investment. Um, and what's crucial is the way we simulate that choice going on there. Uh, we have the same for cars, um, same for household heating devices, and that's, we, we focus on all of the really energy intense uh, technologies. But of course, there are so many sectors in, in the economy that we can't cover everything in, in detail with technology. Uh, the, model, the macroeconomic model itself, that's a demand-led model. So I'm going to give the detail that uh, perhaps Hector didn't really specify yesterday and perhaps should have. Uh, okay, so it's a demand-led, it's a post-Keynesian model. So it starts from evaluating, estimating demand for goods and services. So it has a uh, number of econometric regressions and we uh, run them into the, the future. Okay, demand, production, employment. So it's regressed on data going back to 1970. Um, well what's important, okay, so you've got aggregate demand, con um, consumption category, there are 43 consumption categories. Um, <coughs> 43 industrial sectors, so that means, and there's 61 regions of the world or well, the whole world divided in 61. That means, let's say, 15 regressions times 43 sectors times 61 regions. It's, it's something of the order of 60,000 regressions. Okay. <coughs> um, 
we have technological progress that leads to endogenous growth, so I could answer questions if you've got some on this. I see as a key component, there's no crowding out of financial resources, so banks create credits. There's a detailed input output structure, so how each sector adds value to uh, other sectors and so on. And um, yeah, high sectoral and regional resolution. Okay, so what did we find? <clears throat> All right, so we made a number of um, projections of technology, right? And I put them alongside the International Energy Agency's projections to contrast. So what I'm going to do here is take the premise that investors will look at the International Energy Agency's forecasts to form their expectations. So I, I just make that assumption to have a, a basic scenario against which to compare. Right, so imagine that investors do that, and what instead happens is one of the scenarios we simulate with our model. That would be uh, the difference between those things we would ascribe to uh, possible errors in investment. So imagine, say, here's the International Energy Agency's forecast or projections for power generation at the top uh, by fuel type, and road transportation, um, no, I think it's all, all of transportation, here by fuel type again. You can see that the IE expects oil demand to keep growing and growing up to around 2050. At least that was the case in the World Energy Outlook. I think this was the 2016 version. <clears throat> Instead, we've got a projection us of power generation technology and here transportation technology. That's quite different. What you see in ours is because we're modeling all these fleets of ever higher efficiency and different types of engines that with the energy efficiency coming, you, you've got a peaking of the sort of uh, petrol and diesel powered vehicles coming in, and their use of energy also peaks. But this is, in fact, the units are present kilometers here, but I'll show again. But you've got some energy, uh, so electric vehicles here and some gas based vehicles here. And if you meet a two degree target, by construction, you're going to have to have change of technology that reduces fuel use. So here there's a more rapid transformation. But this here is what we think is the current trajectory of technology according to our detailed modeling of fleets. So that contrasts quite a bit with the IE. So then we can trace through the economy the use of all these fuels, right? So we've got coal up here, uh, middle distillates that's uh, transformed oil, so it's petrol and diesel and aviation fuel and so on. Um, here you've got natural gas, and here you've got all the fuel users we have in the model. So the big blue one is power generation. So that's, that's the use of coal for electricity. Now, you can see that for mobility, for, for transportation, already in our baseline we see a peaking of oil. And that's starting to be discussed now in um, finance, that there could be peak demand for oil. Right. If that's the case, that's going to be a big thing. But, so the question is, if somebody invested in equipment to extract oil based on this projection, and this is what happened instead, there'd be a lot of oil that ends up not being consumed out of what's being drilled for. Okay, so what happens in the economy when we have a change of technology? So you've got low carbon investment. Don't see there. Look up an investment that creates jobs, GDP, and economic activity in those sectors where you've that are, that are concerned. That will be manufacturing, that will be uh, engineering, um, of course, the electricity sector itself. Perhaps there could be prices of electricity going up, but now the price of solar panels is so low that it might not even be the case anymore. But then there's decline, the decline in demand for fossil fuels in countries where that really matters in the economy. That's not everywhere. Right. But that could mean that production, GDP and jobs are going down in those countries. And then there's important effects to do with trade. So if say, if, say in countries where there's not a lot of production of fossil fuels, um, <coughs> you get rid of the consumption of fossil fuels, that leaves, a, that leaves a lot of money to be spent domestically. 
right? So that typically is good for the economy. That's Europe, Japan, China. But while <coughs> for countries that are really heavily in, involved in exporting fuels, like the US, Canada, the Middle East, um, they're the obviously going to have quite a bit of a loss, and it changes the trade balance quite substantially. And then we have to make specific assumptions as to what we think decisions are going to be in the Middle East. So you know that the Middle East controls the oil market uh, quite a bit through the quota of production they choose, right? So if they see a future in which they think that there's a limited amount of oil and gas they can sell, it's possible that they try to push as much as they can into the market so that it's their oil that's being sold, not somebody else's, right? That's sort of a... Okay. It's just, um, instead of keeping the oil in the ground, it's to push it in the market uh, as quickly as possible. So it's not what, you know, selling out means uh, crazy, you know. It's, it's ah. <laughs> well, you, you, you could call it fire sale in, uh, in, in finance. Okay, so you just leave what you said. Okay, so you know that there's an ordering of the... Um, fossil fuel markets in the world where some types of resources are much more costly to, to produce than some others. In the Middle East, they have a monopoly for a reason because the production costs are much lower. You can see this in the data. If you look, we have this database of 65,000 oil and gas assets and you can see there's a, a distribution of break-even production costs that's really uh, quite broad. But if you look regionally, this is the US, this is Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia and the Middle East in general can produce at much, much lower cost. So it's almost impossible not to have a concentration of fossil fuel markets towards the Middle East. Okay, so what did we find? We found that we made these projections of, uh, in the three scenarios here, you've got a peaking of, in the demand for oil. Um, I focus on oil because that's more financially relevant. Um, in the 2030s. But the distribution of these losses of production are not even across the world. On top of that, if the market concentrates in the Middle East, the price has got to decline. That's the, the competitive effect that's happening. And depending how much the Middle East pushes oil into the market can have different outcomes for what is the marginal cost of the, of the product. And finally, these are the macroeconomic effects. So you can see that uh, the USA in red here is losing quite a bit of GDP over that period. And Canada sees a quite a disaster. That's to do with shutting down the whole sector and everything that's upstream from that, right? Well, I'm coming there. I'm coming, I'm coming to that. Okay, so... Here's the, if you accumulate these numbers for uh, what the amount of oil, gas and coal that is never consumed, you get these bars here, these negative are losses, right? But I've accumulated GDP change and added it to that plot just so you can, just for people to compare. And now you can see a lot of geopolitics appear in that graph because it really shows where some countries are winning out of this because they're just getting rid of expensive imports while other countries are losing a bit. Now the question is, by getting rid of climate policies, does the US get rid of that problem? Okay, first, uh, I forgot to say, this is the total one to four trillion when you discount it. Okay, now we've redone this simulation by taking the US out of, the, of climate policies to see what happens. And it's interesting, the model says not very much happens. It's more or less the same result. If you look at the dashed lines here, it's sort of the same trajectory. Now the reason is not so simple, but effectively it's because US policy doesn't control what happens in other countries. That's, that's what it is. So if other countries don't consume oil, that America consumes oil or not makes not that much difference. So overall what happens is this. Importers are well off. If they stay in climate policies, that's because they get a double benefit, double dividends by investing in low carbon technology, they employ people, and they reduce their imports of expensive fossil fuels and reduce their trade balance. High cost producers, they may 
they will lose the fossil fuel industry, but they might get some benefits still from investing in low carbon. But if they don't want to have climate policies, then they lose everything because they don't even have the uh, fossil, f the, they have neither the fossil fuel industry nor the investment stimulus, and then they might even have to start importing fossil fuels from the, the Middle East. So that's what explains the, the story. That uh, has uh, had quite of, uh, an impact in the newspapers when it came out a year ago. Okay, um, well, I had a few more slides to explain our new project, but I'll stop here, and if anybody wants to know more about this, well, just come and talk to me. Thanks very much. Questions? all of the um, economic modelling, but my question is nothing like this has happened in the past. So to what extent are you beholden to past data that is not relevant to the future? Yeah, so it depends where, what, in which sort of um, quantity we're talking about. So for example, investment, it's not, it's not a huge difference if you look at, it's, it's less investment, but you can see sectors where there's been loss of investment with a loss of, of, of demand for product, for example. So I think that's not too badly constrained. Um, of the energy demand equations, that, that could be more relevant ways, what are you saying? Because perhaps we don't have a situation where really there's been a peaking in the demand and going down, so that, that becomes a bit true. Um, I think employment, that should be relatively safe. So depending on which equation, I think that, that we may be safer or less safe. Uh, and then of course the technology itself, were, but that's not econometric, so that we're outside of the range. Uh, Thank you so much. Um, it's extremely interesting. Uh, I, was, I was just wondering for two things. Uh, the, the first one, could you clarify a little bit uh, what are the blister assumptions about the behavior of the financial investors? I mean, uh, my understanding is that you take into account how investors think. I, I didn't understand very well if you have something more explicit about uh, finance in terms of that. And second, am I right to suppose, to, to, uh, to uh, did understand well, that what you actually have is a kind of a more static approach in terms of the way that the fossil fuel sector will react to that? Because if the fossil fuel sector knows that this is going to happen, someone could say that they will try to change their business model in order to invest a little bit more in renewables, which means that the same companies could try to adapt to the new reality, which probably could reduce the transitional risks. I, I don't know if this makes sense or if you have taken that into account. Okay. First, the investment behavior is uh, determined by an econometric regression about investment. So if there's more activity in a sector, there's more investment to expand production capacity such that it's able to respond to changes of demand in the future, right? So there's expansion, then um, production prices, expansion, and it goes into a circle of expansion like that. Um, <coughs> so if, say, in the fossil fuel sector, you've got loss of demand for products, then the investment stops there. And then you see all the effects upstream through the input-output relationships to other sectors. So manufacturing takes a big hit when uh, um, construction in, in the oil and gas sector stops, for example. Okay. Now, <coughs> with respect to um, the financial sector, we've not really modeled anything about decisions in the financial sector much. Right? So what, what we've got is we've just taken the difference between two scenarios. One where you've got never-ending rise of demand and one where it's peaking, and we calculate the difference between the two. So that gives us the fossil fuels that are not consumed. But we've not plugged this to any model, and that, I guess is the next step for us to look into how we put this into a model of finance, what would happen there. And the question is how to treat expectations in a scenario where this happens. Uh, do, do the expectations change all of a sudden, such that you have a re instantaneous revaluation of assets? or do we follow what the price tells us here and something like that. So, and in fact, we're quite open to suggestions as to how people think we should be treating this. Yeah, Michael has another question. 
Thank you very much for an excellent talk that clarified why Trump is an idiot after all. <laughs> but um, uh, more generally, um, you know, it is not because a model has more equations that it's better. Uh, first of all, with respect to the previous question, you know, in the climate literature, there's a saying, well, there's actually, there was a paper that had that title, right? so sta stationarity is dead. So whenever you have to fit on present uh, behavior or past behavior, you have a problem, and that is well known in, in the climate literature because uh, the bigger the model, the more parameters you have to fit, the more you have this problem, okay? So there's less variability. The countervailing behavior, which is not universal, but let's say exists in the climate literature, is a systematic comparison between relatively simple models and much more developed ones. I mean, you know, when you had that list of people I could see, like a so-called IPCC class, uh, uh, GCM or ESM, you know, you are still about a dozen or a dozen and a half people, you know, pretty soon you are gonna be uh, many dozens of people. And you are going to have this problem in spades. So I think that there has to be a system, I mean, I'm just, it's not specific to your talk in general. You have to have a dialogue between not just data and the model you are constructing, but, you know, the big models that, uh, you know, governments and so on like to listen to and simple models that you can understand. Especially since in economics you don't have laws of conservation of mass, conser you know, energy, etc. That's correct. And not money. If it's I, if I can just comment, um, the structure of this is very much dictated by the European Commission because most of the work that's been done with this model was for, for them. So the specification of sectors and so on is pretty <coughs> much in, in line with what they're expecting to see. Um, just to follow this, this question, it's, so... It's, what's called, it's a bigger, it's, it's a bigger, uh, <coughs> you know, uh, rain uh, <laughs> defense, I mean, whatever you used to cover in the uh, Just to follow, in this room we might be all biased towards the low-end emission scenarios, but if you look in YPCC, reports, so they have all these, these scenarios like RCP 8.5, and uh, it's also based on the integrated assessment scenarios. It's also plausible, one of possible scenarios, that basically we continue with fo using fossil fuel as usual and ignore climate consequences. So putting that in the big picture, what you presented today is just one of possible futures. So how you look at that? Hmm. No, I think the, the IPCC, the well, at least the message model for RCP 8.5, that's cost optimization. So for them, that's everybody minimizing cost at the system level. Here we're looking at the trajectory of technology and where it's going in the recent historical data. And then that gives us a certain idea, a reasonable idea, because there's such inertia in technology development that that inertia will prevent radical changes happening within 30 years. So by 2050, we're, we've got reasonable confidence that our projections are or re quite reasonable. Yeah, let, let's wait until 2030 just to see what's going on. But at the moment, fossil fuels emissions are still continue to increase. Yeah, there is no yet a tipping points in the emissions. So what I always buffer in, uh, with lower end emission scenarios that they say tomorrow we will change, tomorrow we will change. And this yeah. kind of moving target. No, but you can see that lots of energy efficiency is committed to the system because it's already been uh, invested in. Right, so that's eating out a little bit of the of the um, demand for fossil fuels, such that I don't think it's possible to reach RCP 8.5 anymore. Yeah. yeah, thank you. That's good message for IPCC. Thank you. Thank you very much.